Okay, Jordan, we're recording another episode of the Jordan Maxwell Show. And since you and I uh, talk so much about astrology, and then you recommend people get a reading, I think it'd be wonderful to let the audience, let the public sample what a complete reading entails. And the way we would do that, we would just do a complete reading of you. I think it's a great idea because people have asked me, well, what is it? Well, is it like a, a regular astrology reading? I said, well, why don't you just get the reading and then you'll find out. So this way people can hear, uh, a, you know, get a general idea about how in-depth a complete reading really is and the, and the work behind it. So, yeah, I think it's a great idea. And I, I don't mind at all the whole world hearing my private and personal uh, chart reading. I don't care. And so, the, I think it's a good idea. And the thing about these complete readings, I think a lot of people are under the misconception this is uh, uh, what you get in the newspaper, which yeah. is very general. When you're looking at the stars with an extreme amount of detail, it's a uh, it's a little bit different. And we'll, uh, we'll, totally different, totally different. Yeah. And what we're doing here, Jordan, uh, once again, I'm using constellations. I'm not using astrological signs. To throw that out there again, astrological signs, what they are, that's a division of the ecliptic, parent path the sun takes around the earth, even though we know it's the earth going around the sun. You take that ecliptic and you divide it into 12, 30 degree equal sectors. And that being said, ecliptical sector one is called Aries, ecliptical sector two is called Taurus, ecliptical sector three is called Gemini. And I find that unfortunate because there's a constellation called Aries. There's a constellation called Taurus. There's a constellation called Gemini. So that's confusing. Um, astrological signs and constellations have nothing to do with each other other than having the same name. So this being said, Jordan, that'd be a nice segue into your chart. You would have been told conventionally, let's look at your chart using astrological signs. You would have been told you're a Capricorn, Sun, Moon, and Capricorn. You would have been told you have a dragon's head in Libra. Okay, well, terms of the way I do the stars, and I also recommend a book to people called Jan Spiller, Astrology for the Soul. That's a book, Astrology for the Soul by Jan Spiller. Astrology for the Soul by Jan Spiller. She really talks a lot about the dragon's head and dragon's tail. So that being said, Jordan, looking at you conventionally using astrological signs, you were always told you have a dragon's head, which is where the moon crosses the ecliptic heading towards the northern hemisphere or north pole. That's what it's called in astronomy, the uh, north node of the moon. In astrology, it's called the dragon's head. That's the positive progressive growth energy. That's an energy one embraces that's basically the sign in the road saying, go in this direction. So conventionally, you would have been told you have a dragon's head in Libra. And that being the case, you would have been told time and time again, you are lucky with partnerships. All right, wait a minute, though. Uh, we should tell uh, the audience that uh, I'm born on December 28th, <clears throat> 1940. December 28th, 1940. Correct. December 28th, 1940, 7.02 p.m. in the evening in Pensacola, Florida. Correct. 28th of December, 1940, 7.02 p.m. in the evening, Pensacola, Florida. Right. And that being said, conventionally with the signs, you would have been told you have a dragon's head, north node of the moon, in Libra. And Libra means uh, partnerships. Because Libra is ruled by Venus, and Venus is the dignified ruler of Libra, and Libra means relationships. Uh, in general, it means a lot of other things too, but in this context, it means relationships. Well, Jordan, I've known you, come this September, it will have been 18 years, and in those roughly 17.5 years I've known you, I've seen absolutely no luck with any partnership whatsoever. Legal, current legal problems substantiating that assertion. Yeah, you got that right. <laughs> I mean, you embracing the energy of a dragon's head in Libra has been pretty much a disaster, or, or in the context of the stars, a disaster. Yeah. Now, 
when we and this is one reason why I think astrological signs are dangerously misleading. The astronomical fact of the matter is, on the 28th of December, 1940, the day you were born, your dragon's head was in Virgo. Virgo. And it was in Virgo, a dragon's head in Virgo, in the 10th house. 10th house is the house of public standing, honor, and career. Now, you and I know, the 17.5 years I've known you, you never set out to be world famous. Nope, sure didn't. But you have a dragon's head in the 10th house of public standing, honor, and career. And I think uh, YouTube bears witness to this, and uh, the extent of your fame um, bears witness to the fact that you do have quite a bit of public standing and honor. You've got your detractors, but the fact is, you're well known, extremely well known. That's what happens when you use a drag, uh, an astrological chart. And what I'm doing here too, when I do a complete reading, I use a solar chart. I use a solar chart. I dispense with ascendance, descendants. It's nice to have a birth time. It makes the position of the moon very precise. But I use a solar chart method, put the sun in the first house, and it always is in the first house, and use constellations. Use constellations. And when you do that, you put the sun in the first house. That makes you a Sagittarian in the first house. Conventional astrology would have said you're a Capricorn. But you have a sun, moon, and Mercury in Sagittarius. And to go off on a bit of a tangent here Sagittarius to my mind since it's ruled by Jupiter and it's a fire energy and it's dignified co-ruler is Neptune Sagittarius is always about relating the individual pieces uh, as to how they fit within the whole and that being said that's a that's a uh, elaborate phrase for saying you're a truth seeker you're not a Capricorn Capricorns about operating in consensus reality and about doing one's duty and being responsible and operating within the establishment. I don't really think that's been the case with your life. I think you, when you're talking about Sagittarius, it's a fire energy, it's ruled by Jupiter. Sagittarius is, you're going to get the truth straight, no chaser. Um, I'm not really concerned with how much it offends you. That's not really my primary consideration. I think that's more or less how you function, Jordan. You have Sun in Sagittarius, your Moon in Sagittarius, and your Mercury in Sagittarius. You're going to hear the truth no matter who I offend. Yeah, well, that's what I've always tried to do. So what sounds more accurate to you, a Sun and Moon in Capricorn, the astrological sign, or using astronomy? Okay, and casting a chart using astronomy, using the constellations, or do you feel that Sagittarius more aptly and, uh, describes you and resonates with you better? Well, of course, uh, Sagittarius is obviously resonating with me because that's exactly what my life has been about, dissecting everything, going for all the details and putting them together into one composite story. And so... That's what I've done all my life. So that's Sagittarius. Uh, that's what it is. And when I do, when I do complete readings, I always say because I don't have hardcore statistics behind what I do. I'm like you, Jordan. You and I, we're both guys who are struggling to get our bills paid. Okay, that's sometimes the uh, that's the journey of uh, pursuing the truth. You sometimes run, run up against that. Not a problem. That being said, though, my point making that statement is I don't have the resources to conduct large-scale statistical studies uh, in regards to what I say. So I always tell people, you're the final authority, not me. I can't work a miracle here. This is some guy's interpretation of what he sees. And then it's up to you to verify the veracity of what I'm saying against what you feel. That's why I asked you that, Jordan. And uh, that being said, before I go back to that dragon's head in Virgo, which is extremely important to you, um, when you have a sun in Sagittarius, I think it's important to look at uh, the aspects of the planets from the vantage point, obviously, as if you're standing on the surface of the Earth, because this is where we have our existence. But I also think it's important to look at planetary aspects from the vantage point as if you're standing on the sun, for a very simple common sense reason. Because our life energy comes from the sun. 
So you and I, strictly speaking, on some level, okay, just even in terms of physics, you and I and everyone else on this earth are the sun. That's where the animating life energy is coming from. But when you do that, when you do that, from the vantage point of the sun, one would be looking at the earth and behind the earth, since your sun's in Sagittarius, behind the earth, 180 degrees opposite, would be the constellation of Gemini. And that's why I say you face the world as a Gemini. When you're doing a solar chart, the first house is you on the inside, your inner essence, where the sun energy is coming from. And it takes a while to get to see that. But what's immediately apparent to people is the seventh house, where you're a Gemini. Because from the vantage point of the sun, if you looked at the Earth-Moon complex, you would see the constellation of Gemini behind the Earth. And when you have the Earth involved in a chart, that represents the relationship you have with everyone else on the Earth. So people immediately see you as a Gemini. Okay, well, Gemini. Gemini gets a bad, has a bad reputation in astrology as being superficial and flaky. I think that's a very ignorant statement. I think, I'd say Gemini is an air constellation, and air constellations always mean intellect. They mean the mind. So Gemini, to me, my interpretation, because I've looked at the books, I looked at what people can read online, you can get various interpretations of Gemini. I've come to my own conclusions, and I think Gemini, being an air constellation, represents the intellect. It's dignified rulers, Mercury. Gemini means the eternal student and the eternal teacher. And if anybody qualifies as a teacher, I think that's Jordan Maxwell. And I think that's the relationship most people on the earth have with you. Why? Because your sun is in Sagittarius, but opposite Sagittarius is Gemini, which from the vantage point of the sun is your earth-moon complex. The whole world relates to you as a Gemini. That's, that's it. You're the teacher. That's what happens when you use a solar chart method like this and you use constellations. Now, you would have been told conventionally, uh, if we use the solar chart method using signs, you face the world as a cancer. I don't think so. I think you face the world as a Gemini, Jordan. How do you feel about that? Since I always tell people, never abandon your own common sense, your own intellect and judgment. This is just some guy's interpretation of what he sees, but you verify the veracity of that statement, Jordan. Well, I mean, I go on and, and explain that, but everything you've said so far is exactly right. You know, it fits me to a T. See, and then that sun energy, I think that I've looked at various definitions of the sun, and they'll say things like it represents your vitality, it represents your essence. That being said, I, I would like to have a more precise definition. I, from looking at your chart, looking at other people's chart, I think the sun is a quality in the chart that represents the heroic side of the person, the part of them that makes them admirable. I really think the sun as opposed to the moon, because the moon to me, the moon, the moon represents one's immediate, visceral, habitual, instinctual reaction to things. Okay, but the sun is almost the person saying, hey, this is the right thing to do in this situation. I'm going to make a, a conscious choice to do the right thing. It's almost like the sun energy represents you f working with your higher self, so to speak. It's the part of you that's heroic. In this situation, this is the right thing to do. So your sun's in Sagittarius. Once again, the thing that makes you extremely admirable and heroic, and I can say this having known you 17.5 years, you are the truth seeker par excellence. And I've never seen you sell out. <laughs> That's one that, you can be accused of many things, and you do have your detractors. We know that, you know that. Everyone's all too aware of that. But one thing, uh, particularly you at 73 years of age. I don't think anyone can ever accuse you of selling out. No. So that's the sun in Sagittarius to me, that whatever the cost, whatever the price, I want to know the truth. I want to know the truth. I want to know how all the parts interrelate and how they connect and, and fit within the totality of existence. That's my understanding of Sagittarius, and you have your son in Sagittarius. And you face the world as a Gemini, and Gemini's dignified ruler is Mercury, because Gemini is about the crystallization of knowledge. It's thinking rationally and logically. Well, you have your Mercury, the dignified ruler of Gemini, in Sagittarius, 
where you know one could say it's in its fall because it's operating in a in a realm that, that uh, Neptune and Jupiter control. Sagittarius, the rulers of Sagittarius are Jupiter and Neptune, and they're parts of the mind that are not strictly constrained by rationality and logic. Think about Neptune. Neptune rules the dream state. That's not a realm of rationality and logic. And think about trying to explain your dreams to anyone, trying to take a Neptunian experience everyone has at night, and trying to convey just exactly what one's dreams entail. It's kind of hard. I've never been able to adequately do it. You can't really make Neptune function in a mercurial way. It doesn't do it so well. I'm making the point. You've got your Mercury in Sagittarius, and there's aspects to the mind that are not strictly constrained by logic and rationality. And Sagittarius is opposite Gemini. Sagittarius is ruled by Jupiter. That, to me, is more the intuitive function of the mind. Jupiter basically says, I've got a hunch. This is what it means. Or Jupiter is, is the, synth the part of the mind that synthesizes all the particular details of Gemini and says, These, this detail, this detail, this connects to that, this connects to that. When you connect this dot to this dot to that dot, it, it means this. Once again, it's interrelating all the specific individual pieces to see how they fit within the totality of the, of the entirety of it. Okay? And that's where your Mercury is. So you think like a truth seeker. That's it. You're always thinking, what, what does it all mean? Okay? So that's your sun. That's your Mercury. Mercury, your thinking process. And once again, Mercury has a lot to do with how one speaks. So, you know, a Mercury in Sagittarius, just the way you are, it's like, you're going to get it straight, no chaser. <laughs> That's pretty much it. I'm sorry it offends you, but I've got my Mercury, my moon in Sagittarius, which is a fire energy. I'm going to tell you like it is. Sometimes I'm going to be brutally frank and brutally honest about what's really going on. Well, you know, Jordan, how's that feel to you? That's the interpretation I get looking at this stellium, three or more planetary energies, even though the sun's a star, in Sagittarius. Yeah, well, that's, that's me, all right. I've had a lot of people you know, tell me that, that you're, you're very blunt and, and brutal with, with certain subjects that should be handled differently. I said, well, I, I'm just telling you the truth. I mean, you know, I'm, not trying to, I'm not trying to start a religion. I'm trying to uh, educate you to what's really going on here. So... Now, this all gets back to, well, let's talk about the moon, as I said, and we're going to finally get back to that dragon's head in the 10th house. That moon of yours, you have the sun, the admirable heroic qualities of yourself in Sagittarius. You have Mercury in Sagittarius, how your mind functions. And then you have the moon in Sagittarius and the moon and your moon conjuncts your sun. The moon conjuncts your sun. Let me verify that. Yep, you have a sun-moon conjunctions, and conjunctions are extremely powerful. They're enhancement aspects. It enhances, it just, it's just, it's a, conjunctions are just a nice synergistic energy. So you have that conscious, heroic, admirable quality of yourself, which is basically the truth seeker. No one can look at your career and say otherwise. I mean, 73 years old, it's too late to say otherwise. It's been, it's in the record. That's it. And the record speaks for itself. But the moon, as opposed to the sun, the moon, my opinion, is one's immediate, uh, visceral, habitual, instinctual response to things. The moon rules cancer. So the nature of the moon is like sticking food in your mouth. No one makes a conscious, rational decision eating a piece of chocolate to make it taste like tomato soup. You just, your body just reacts viscerally to it. That's it. Well, I think it's the same thing when it comes to one's emotions. Okay, now one can exert self-control and not always blurt out exactly what they think of someone else, but everybody has their emotional response to things, whether it's listening to a piece of music, looking at a piece of art, tasting a piece of food, you know, first impression of someone else. But the point being is, it's the emotional response. So you have your sun in Sagittarius, you have your moon in Sagittarius. So even on a visceral level, an unconscious level, so to speak, you are just a truth seeker. That's it. Anything not pertaining to the truth, it's pretty much probably going to highly offend you. Highly offend you. Because the sun conjuncts the moon in Sagittarius. And also, too, that moon in Sagittarius. 
that's going to give you a very intuitive understanding of things. You're the kind of person I would be of the opinion when you get a hunch about something, you're going to go with the hunch. Why? Because all this energy is in Sagittarius, and it's, Sagittarius is ruled by Jupiter. Dignified co-ruler is Neptune. That's the intuitive part of the mind. It's not necessarily strictly a super rational process with you. I've got a hunch. I've got a feeling. Something's going on here. I can't quite articulate it. My Mercury is in Sagittarius. It's not in Gemini. So I can't articulate it with absolute crystal clear logic. But I've got a hunch. This is what this means. This is taking me somewhere. See? Now, you have that Mercury in Sagittarius, you have a dragon's head in the 10th house, which led us into this segue discussing all those things. You have a dragon's head in Virgo in the 10th house. And Virgo, to my mind, Virgo's an earth energy, and Mercury is dignified and exalted in Virgo. Virgo, to me, means explaining things with rigor and precision like an engineer. Virgo's highly analytical, highly detailed oriented. Well, you have that in the 10th house. You have Mercury and Sagittarius in the first house. And uh, in one instance, I would say you are your career. Why? Dragon's head in Virgo in the 10th house of career. Ruler of Virgo. Mercury in the first house. You are your career. You live this 24-7. That is the name of the tune. That's it. You are the career. First house means the person, their inner essence, who they are. I exist, here I am, this is what I am. Mercury in Sagittarius, dignified, exalted ruler of Virgo in the 10th house of career. Okay? And then when you look at that, well, that's one thing you do, Jordan. You face the world as a Gemini, you're a teacher, but you're a Virgo in the 10th house. That's what you do. You explain things in an amazing amount of detail. And anyone who's personally seen your research, and you've said this time and time again publicly, you have meticulously gone through and documented and done the research behind everything you say. And I've seen the notes, and other people have seen your library when it's not being stolen from you. <laughs> no. And you, just the highlighting, the amount of time you spent there. But think about that dragon's head in Virgo in that 10th house of career. And you also have the planet Neptune in Virgo. And Neptune rules your dragon's tail, your dragon's tail is in Pisces. You would have been told in the past your dragon's tail is in Aries. And some of that's going to resonate with you because you've got Jupiter conjunct Saturn in Aries, even though it's closer to Cetus. But the astronomical fact is your dragon's tail, okay? When you look at a sky map, astronomically speaking, that dragon's tail of yours is in Pisces. Pisces is ruled by Neptune. You have Neptune where your dragon's head is. So, Neptune, to my mind, is all things not constrained by rationality and logic. That's, that's art, okay? Let's talk about the nature of Neptune, because it's very important where it is in your 10th house of career. Well, uh, if we put Mercury in Virgo and we looked at a, a drawing of the human figure, Gray's Anatomy, the way a doctor would look at the human figure, that would be Mercury and Virgo looking at the human figure in a highly detailed, analytical, rational, precise, and rigorous manner. Okay, so how do you explain Pablo Picasso's portrayal of the human figure? Because they are anatomical atrocities and nightmares and monstrosities. Well, it doesn't matter. With Pablo Picasso, you're in the realm of Pisces and Neptune. You're not constrained by logic and rationality. And think about it. Neptune, they say it's the higher octave of Venus. So, uh, Venus is the planet of love. Well, Neptune's its higher octave. It's more sublime, more profound type of love. So you could say Neptune rules empathy and compassion, right? Take the example of grandma. Hey, grandma's 94 years old. All she does is pass gas all day and drink tea. The rational and logical thing to do, Mercury and Virgo, throw her off a damn cliff. It's not productive anymore. Virgo means work. She don't work, right? But when you get into the realm of Pisces, which is the realm of Neptune, most people are not going to do that because they've got compassion and they love their grandmother. See? So I'm making the point. Neptune, higher octave of Venus. It, it, it's, it's, a, it's a sublime form of love. But it's not constrained by rationality. Think about love relationships. Venus, Neptune, 
How many of those are constrained by rationality and logic? How many people have thought <laughs> the realm of Pisces? Why am I with this person? They drive me crazy, but I love them to death. See? Because love, it's going to expand beyond the boundaries of any definition, which would be Mercury and Virgo. I'm making the point, Jordan. In your Virgo, where your dragon's head is, you have Neptune there. You operate in realms where you're talking about spirituality, Neptune, things somewhat beyond just a very strictly rational point of view. That being said, though, Neptune is in Virgo and your dragon's head there. I don't know of any other man on this planet who gets into more precise delineation of what is what in terms of spirituality and religion than Jordan Maxwell. I mean, you pretty much started an entire new genre. So wouldn't you be inclined to think on the basis of this inter interpretation that explains why you are where you are and what, why you do what you do? It's a dragon's head sign on the road in the chart saying, go in this direction, embrace this energy in this particular area of your life. It's a dragon's head in Virgo in the 10th house. Go out there, explicate, explain to people logically, rationally, point by point. Explain what? Well, Neptune in Virgo in the 10th house. Explain religion, explain spirituality. And Neptune's the dignified ruler of your south node in Pisces. You're totally tapping into that dragon's tail to explain religion and spirituality to people and the truth of the matter because Neptune is also the dignified co-ruler of Sagittarius. You're basically telling people, wake up, look at the big picture, people. That's your 10th house of career. Now, you and I know, you've said it on other episodes, that you're just an ordinary man uh, pursuing extraordinary knowledge. You used to put shelves in office, Jordans. You used to paint the walls in the office. You were a contractor. You did not set out to be world famous. But that being said, you've got a dragon's head in Virgo in the 10th house of honor, public standing, and career. Looks to me like the dragon's head put you where you are despite yourself. You are very eminent. You are very prominent. Don't you think this makes a little more sense than a dragon's head in Libra? Oh, absolutely. No doubt about that. Now, this dragon's... Another thing, too, I think needs to be said when I do a complete reading. I'm not of the opinion that these... The sun, our star, the moon, planetary body, uh, satellite around the Earth, Venus, these other planets, dragon's head and tail, nodal points... I'm not of the opinion we are puppets on the string, and this is strictly a deterministic process where these planets are making us do things. I think something else is going on that's a little more subtle than that. Once again, you and I on some fundamental level, everyone on the Earth, we are the energy of the sun. So you can make an argument, well, we are the sun. I think also, too, on another subtle level, we're also Saturn, we're also Neptune, we're also Pluto. and. Uh, you know, it seems to me that these planets and this natal chart, it's just basically reflecting the fact that, you know, the soul sort of incarnated at a time when the energies reflected the essence of that soul. There's, I haven't quite figured this out yet. I don't have the IQ of a Bobby Fischer, Stephen Hawking, Albert Einstein, an alien and God. I think it really requires that to really get to the heart of what, what is behind astrology. I really think it takes that much intelligence. I don't have it, but I just want to make the point. I think when one's getting a chart reading, you're looking at uh, more subtle aspects of one's character. And that's what I'm good at. I can't predict the weather three weeks from now using astrology. I'm not that good. But you, can, I seem to be able to look at a natal chart and really, really understand a person's character. Mm -hmm. And that gives one a lot of predictive power. Because I basically know you, with this energy in Sagittarius, pretty much t Jordan Maxwell is going to produ uh, uh, pursue the truth to the ends of the earth no matter what the cost. That's it. you know. And we haven't even talked about your Jupiter, the ruler of Sagittarius, conjunct Saturn and Aries in the fifth house. Okay, But you can look at this and you can sort of see this is the character of this person. This is what they're going to do. And I think what else is going on here too 
people sometimes think they're going to get a chart reading and they want to know, you know, when am I going to hit the lottery? When's Prince Charming coming in? I think when you're getting your chart read, uh, at least to me, um, you're basically realizing, whoa, wait a second, wait a second. I have my role in the society, which is basically pretty much a cookie cutter role, okay? Go to school, go get a paycheck, go do this, go do that, okay? Cookie cutter, like every other citizen, so to speak. But there are more primordial forces flowing through you, and that's what I think the chart really reflects. It's sort of showing, hey, there's a cosmological evolutionary process at work, and you're part of a, an entirety called a species, which is human. You have your evolutionary role within that species. So you, Jordan, just say you were back to uh, installing drywall, and installing shelving in office buildings, and you were a contractor. It doesn't matter. In the, in the time when you're not doing that, you're still going to be relentlessly pursuing the truth and in that sense that's that's an aid to the evolutionary progress of the species there's one person among us who's going to get to the bottom of things here and that, that might just be as simple as uh, just going to a bookstore and buying some off-the-wall book that's talking about some very uh, intellectually advanced challenging concept that's beyond consensual reality okay because other people were born on December 28th 1940 they were born with a different set of parents, with different birth dates, so they're going to interact with this energy a little differently than you, okay? But so that person may not have gotten to the level you've gotten, gotten to, because you still have your individuality, but they still, with a chart like this, like you have, they still, okay, I'm going to listen to Jordan Maxwell, and I'm going to go to the library and do a little research on my off hours. They, like you are still part of that evolutionary progress of the species where they're pursuing truth in their own little way, okay? Mm -hmm. So this all being said, Jordan, going back to that dragon's tail, your dragon's tails in Pisces, um, this is such an important part of your chart, particularly for you. And you have it in the fourth house, which is opposite the 10th house. I say houses one through six are the private side of one's life. Houses seven through 12 are always 180 degrees opposite houses one through six. Houses seven through 12 have the same nature of the houses of one through six, except one's me and one's we. Let me explain. House number one is me. I just exist. House number seven is the house of uh, partnerships and how you face the world. It goes from me to we. House number two, they say is the house of one's resources, one's personal bank account. They say house number eight is uh, the house of corporate money. It goes from me to we. Public, a private, house number two, your bank account's private, to house number eight, public. Other people are involved. It's now a corporation. It has to be filed with the Secretary of State. You're gonna merge your resources with other people. House number three is your voice, how you think, that's your mind. House number nine, they say, is the house of publishing. Same sides of the, I mean, different sides of the same coin. It's about the mind. But house number three is more your private thoughts when you publish your thoughts. Now you make them available to the world. It goes from me, my thoughts, to we, our thoughts. So just making the point here about house number four for you. That's the house of home, hearth, clan, tribe, and family, okay? House number 10 is the house of one's honor, career, and public standing. So in one sense, one could say fourth house is more, more your immediate family, people who are genetically related to you, things happening on a familial basis that are more localized. House number 10 is when the public at large becomes your family. That's your distant, 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 distant genetic cousins you're talking to, you know what I'm saying? The public at large. It goes from private, house number four, to house number 10, the public. And that's a balancing act everyone always has in their life. Balancing family with career. Why I'm saying this, you have a dragon's tail in Pisces in that fourth house. The dragon's tail in terms of astronomy, that's a nodal point where the moon crosses the ecliptic heading towards the southern hemisphere, the south pole. What it represents in astrology though is one's karmic legacy. To my mind, since it's the south node of the moon, and the, moon's, the moon itself per se is immediate, habitual, instinctual, and visceral, I think the south node is even more so because it represents lifetime after lifetime exercising these personal habits, these personal characteristics, these coping mechanisms, these personality traits, just over and over again. It's the south node of the moon. 
That's the nature of a dragon's tail. One goes there immediately because it's the south node of the moon and the moon itself is immediate, instinctual, and visceral. That south node is even stronger. Yours is in Pisces, in the fourth house of home. So in the context of your chart, knowing what I know about you and what the world knows about you, I would say this is someone who had a home that was very Piscean, was very spiritual. Well, what's that lend credence to? It wouldn't be so far of a leap to say that's someone who lived in monasteries or chapels or was pursuing spiritual truth. That's, that's where they dwelt. And then you can just extrapolate that even further and say more than likely they led a life of renunciation and sacrifice. You can just come to that conclusion. Okay? Then, knowing what I know about you, I would say this explains why Jordan Maxwell does not give a damn about money. It offends you on the highest levels. I personally think when people come in and want to promote your work and want to help you, when they start talking about turning it into a for-profit operation, it goes against everything you are and every fiber of your being, being down to the molecular and atomic level. I really think it offends you that bad. Why do I say that? Dragon's tail in Pisces. Life and lifetime after lifetime of renunciation. I don't care about the material world. I'm in pursuit of spiritual truth. That's what motivates me, not commerce, not money. And it's a dragon's tail in Pisces, which is ruled by Neptune, dignified co rulers Jupiter. When you operate that way, people think you're crazy. They literally think you're absolutely insane. <laughs> they get very angry. That's true. And it's a dragon's tail. My observations of how dragon's tails have operated in people's lives is the dragon's tail, for some metaphysical reason that I don't understand, I have my speculations, but I'll keep it at that for now, dragon's tail in Pisces, it causes stress. It causes stress. Well, look what's happened to you, Jordan, for the 17.5 years I've known you how much stress it's caused you when uh, you're partnering up with people under the presumption you have a dragon's head in Libra. You don't. It's in Virgo. And they basically start getting the idea. He's not in this for the money. And then you start to tell them, well, that offends me. That offends me when you just think this is a commercial venture. It offends me to my core. You do not understand. You don't comprehend. See, my Mercury's in Sagittarius, so I can't quite articulate it precisely for you. You don't understand how much that offends me when you try to turn what I do into a commercial for-profit adventure. See, now I talked to this, this freak guy named Joey. They, he says I got a dragon's tail in Pisces in my fourth house. Do you realize I've led lifetime after lifetime after lifetime in pursuit of spiritual truth? That I'm not in this for commercial reasons i'm not so when you suggest that and that becomes the emphasis you just offend me you offend me spiritually you offend me emotionally you offend me intellectually you offend me on every possible level because that is not what i'm about at all you're right let me explain that to the audience let me explain that to the audience uh, <clears throat> I I have tried over and over and over again for the past 40 some odd years of speaking publicly to explain it's not that I don't uh, that I'm not interested in business or money uh, obviously I'm not stupid I have tried to show the world I am not stupid I study and read continually and I am analyzing everything in life around me, so I'm not stupid. But when I'm, I, but, but my feeling is, and I've told all these people who call themselves my partners and they want to partner up with me and, and have, be in business with me. My feeling is, if you're doing something to partner up with me or doing something with me with the intention of making a lot of money off of my work, then you are highly offending me. Because now you're looking at me like I'm a piece of something to be sold, to make a quick buck for you, to make you some money. 
but I'm but what I have tried to explain to people, but nobody seems to get this point. I don't know why. It must be very difficult intellectually to grasp. I'm always telling people who wanted to be a business with me, if you going to, if you want to make if you want to be in business with me to make money, then forget it because it's not going to work. My God, who gave me my life, will not allow my work to be used to make you a lot of money. That's not why my God allowed me to live and brought me here. I'm highly, highly respectful of the concept of God. And I do believe that we have a creator. And I do not believe for one instance that my creator allowed me to have my life and to do my work so I can make you a couple of goddamn bucks. That's not why I came into this world to do. I came into this world to fulfill my personal destiny. And my personal destiny, like Nikolai Tesla and, and, Al, and Albert Einstein and all the other, and Mich Michelangelo and uh, Nostradamus and all the other people who live like this. My destiny is to pursue my work. Albert Einstein would tell you the same thing. Uh, Leonardo da Vinci would tell you the same thing. Michelangelo would tell you the same thing. Raphael would tell you the same thing. I don't give a damn about making a lot of money for you. I don't care about making money for you. I'm not stupid. Of course we need money. And I, and I live without money because, I, because of, uh, of my total uh, disregard for making a lot of money. I don't care about money. I care about the honesty and the decency of my work and to pursue my work before my God, before the great spirit in the universe, to pursue my work in sincerity. However, having said that, I also appreciate that money is important in life and even Nikolai Tesla and Albert Einstein and all the other great minds uh, understood that so I tell people if you want to make uh, if you want to go in business with me and do something to help me and if in, in your mind you're thinking you're going to make a lot of money off of me then you have offended the God who brought me here you have offended the divine spirit that operates in my heart you've offended me but having said that if you want to come in to be a partner and help me for the right reason, because you see the value of my life and my work and who I am and what I am trying to accomplish by helping my fellow man to educate themselves. If you are coming in to help me for that reason, then the money will come. If you're coming in to help me to do something for the right purpose, for the right spiritual reason, that you see in my work and my person something of value and want to help me to do my work to uncover all the darkness and all the lies and treachery and, and conspiratorial mess that's on the earth. If you want to come in to help me because you believe in my spirit and what I'm trying to do, then the money will come. But if you're only doing it to make a quick buck, my God will not allow that. The great spirit that animates my heart and animates me to stay alive is re that's repugnant to my nature. If you're going to use me and my work to make you a quick buck and to make you uh, uh, so you can drive a fancy new car because in your personal life, you are not worth a crap. You don't have a job. You're not able to do anything of any value. You're, you're just trying to get by from day to day because you have no brains. You don't have any talent. You don't have anything. And so you think you're going to use Jordan Maxwell to make you a lot of money. Well, that is offending the God who created me. That's offending me. I didn't come here to make you a lot of money. But if you do it for the right reason, the money would come. But unfortunately, the people that I've been in business with don't see it that way. All they know is that Jordan Maxwell 
is possible to make us a lot of money. We'll put this old man out there and like a horse, we'll ride him into the sunset, making a lot of money off of him. Well, my God has never allowed that. And that's why you will hear people saying, well, don't do anything with Jordan Maxwell because you're not going to, you're going to lose money. You're not going to make any money off of him. And I say, you're damn right you're not going to. Because your whole essence of why you're coming in to help me is to make a quick buck. But if you coming in to help me for the right reason, then the money would come as an outcome from your, as a, as a, as a logical outcome for your hard work and determination to do something of value for the family, for the human family. Then, like Jesus said, what you sow, you reap. So if you're sowing with the right intention to help your fellow man and to spiritually help the human family, then the money would come. But nobody so far has seen that. No one seems to understand that Christian principle. And so most of uh, everybody that's come in to help me has helped me because they think they're going to own me and make a lot of money off of this old man before he dies. We're going to ride him into the sunset, making a quick buck off of him. Well, that has never happened. It's not happening now, and it's never going to happen. Not because I don't like it. It's because God doesn't like it. It's because the very spirit of who I am and what I do is repugnant to that idea of me going out to make a lot of money. That's why I don't have any money. Not because I'm stupid, not because I hate money, no. It's because I live my life for a spiritual reason. And those people who have come in around me see me only as a way to make themselves a quick buck. And that's why I'm saying I'm not stupid. I, I need money like anyone else. But I'm never going to sell out. I've been have had so many opportunities to do movies, to to work on te uh, television shows and television industry, and to go on the speaking circuit. But I'm not interested in doing those kind of things to entertain the public. I'm not here to entertain the public and go on television and give speeches and roam around the world and give lectures at $10,000 a, a lecture. No, that's not who I am. I prefer to live in a monastery and to talk to spiritual people in sincerity and try and, uh, and enlighten my fellow man spiritually. And I would, I, I much prefer doing it like a Michelangelo and like a Leonardo da Vinci and like a Giordano Bruno. I'd like, I, I prefer living in one room with nothing and pursuing 24 seven wisdom, knowledge and understanding. So I just want the public to understand. It's not that I hate money. No, I need money. I just don't have any, but the reason why I don't have any is because the people around me do not want to help me for the right reason. Therefore, it makes no money. If, if I can find someone that would help me for the right reason, seeing the value of my person and my life and my pursuit and my passion and why I do what I do, study, read 24-7 and do radio interviews is to help my fellow man, to help guide the human race. But if you're coming in to help me to make a quick buck, don't even bother. My God will not allow it. So that's why I today at this moment have nothing. I own and have nothing because I refuse to be bought. I refuse to sell out and go on television and make a lot of money and dazzle the audience and uh, you know prance around, prance around the stage or and like the TV preachers and, and, and dazzle people with, uh, with spiritual knowledge, no. I, I refuse to do that. My, my, my mission in this world is to help my fellow man spiritually. And because of that, I've been ripped off, lied to, and treated like a fool because I am not interested in quick, making a quick buck. So you're right. 
the stars are, are exactly right. That's who I am. And, and if someone doesn't want to come in to help me the right way, then it won't happen at all. If they came in to help me for the right reason, then the money would come. But I haven't found anybody like that yet. And George, okay. so this all being said, yeah. this is what I think uh, makes a chart reading helpful in the sense that I'm telling you what you already know about yourself. But it's in a context of looking at what's out there in the solar system, what's out there in the cosmos. And it basically just says, once again, on some cosmological quantum level, you're fundamentally constituted this way. And it's good to have this articulated about one's character because it just makes it, a, makes it a little clearer and puts it into, a, gives you more clarity and more, gives you more perspective. Like you, it's very suggestive in your chart, this dragon's tail in Pisces. You've led lives of spiritual renunciation in terms of material wealth. You don't care. It's suggestive. Drag his tail and Pisces in the fourth house. This is somebody who spent time cloistered away pursuing knowledge. They weren't dealing with the mundane dirt and dust of day-to-day -day existence, existence trying to scrape by to make a quick buck. See? And then you, another dignified co ruler of your dragon's tail in Pisces is Jupiter. You have Jupiter in the fifth house. Okay? And strictly speaking, it's in the constellation of Aries, but due to the procession of the equinoxes, it's in a part of Aries where it's not really the fiery part of Aries, in my estimation. It's closer to a constellation called Cetus, which is right below Pisces and extends a little bit below Aries. That being said, when you look at Cetus, Pisces itself is always about what's sublime and what's profound, whether in terms of art, spirituality, okay? Cetus, the definition I've read of Cetus, and I found this on the internet, because this is what happens when you're using constellations, you're getting into uncharted territory. I heard Cetus represents exploding the collective unconscious. And once again, I mean, the fact of the matter is you were basically named at Conspiracy Con as what? The godfather of secret societies? They had a whole entire ceremony just in your honor because you started this genre. So that being said, I think it's an apt description looking at Saturn conjunct Jupiter in your fifth house, which is in the bottom portion of Aries, but it's very close to a constellation called Cetus, which means exploding the collective unconscious. And I don't know of anyone who's done that better than you. And I'm not saying that for flattery purposes. I think the record attests to that. Okay. And then when you look at this fifth house, uh, my understanding of the nature of the fifth house, you've got a dragon's tail in Pisces in the fourth house, dignified co-ruler of Pisces, Jupiter's conjunct Saturn in the fifth house. Well, the fifth house is different than the seventh house. Seventh house can represent the house of marriage. Fifth house represents the house of love and romance. And love and romance leads to babies. Nature doesn't require one to be married to have babies, to have offspring. That's a function of the fifth house, love and romance. But I extrapolate that to a higher level. I think one can do that. Um, like the second house. One can say the second house is the house of one's personal money, one's personal stash of cash, one's bank account. You can take that to a higher level. You can say, well, that also means the second house, logically, using some common sense, would be the ha have to be the house of one's values. Because whatever you spend your money on is going to be a pretty much a direct reflection of your values. So I think it's the same thing in the fifth house. You could say, oh, that's the house of love and romance. Well, that's also the house of children. Well, anything involving children, children always have a childlike enthusiasm for everything because everything's brand new. <laughs> they still get excited about Santa Claus and the Great Pumpkin, okay? Point being is that fifth house, that can also be the house of one's entrepreneurial endeavors, one's startup projects, one's hobbies, everything one does just to pursue for the sheer enthusiasm and joy of it. So what I'm trying to say is you have a dragon's tail in the fourth house, area of home, hearth, clan, tribe, and family. It's in Pisces. So you enjoy being cloistered away. And who are your children? Okay, let's look where the uh, let's look at the house of children. Fifth house for Jordan. Jupiter's there, dignified co ruler Pisces. Oh, Jordan's work is his children. That is his family. And it's conjunct Saturn. And Saturn is the, dignif is the dignified ruler of Capricorn, your second house of money and values. So your work 
is your life. It is your children. Anybody messes with your work, is it's like somebody raping someone's daughter. That's how it feels to you, in my opinion. You mess with my work, that's the equivalent of you taking my daughter and raping her before my eyes. I, You tell me, Jordan, this would be my interpretation. Can't say it's gospel truth. I can't work miracles. But I would look at this and be inclined to say, okay, natal chart. It seems to have uh, be very good at determining how a person feels, their natal character. So you mess with Jordan Maxwell's work, that's the equivalent of somebody taking a, a father's taking a father's daughter and raping that daughter right before his eyes. Is that how it feels to you? Exactly how it feels. That's precisely the way I feel. That's ex that's the way I feel about my work. And when someone, when you spend your life pursuing your art, your work, and your you know like like Tesla, and and seeing somebody come in to Tesla's laboratory that he works in 24 7 and destroy it burn it all down and destroy it then you've destroyed the man you've destroyed his his reason for living and so for me my life has been my work because i live it 24 hours a day it's not it's not a job it's my life it's who i am and so for people uh to come in and steal my work and steal what I have done. I don't care about the money. They can take the money all they want. I don't care about the money. That's what thieves are concerned with. They don't care about stealing something of, of value. They care about how much money can I get from this. Well, the people who have stolen my website and stolen my work and stolen everything I have worked for, they don't care about me or my personal life and my work. All they care about is how much money can we make off of this old man before he dies. And so you are absolutely right. That's the way I feel about my work. I put my whole life into my work. And, and I don't care what people say about me. I don't care about how much money is stolen from me. I don't care what people say about me. All I care about is the pursuit of spiritual knowledge and wisdom and understanding. And, and, and you're right, uh, I, you know, my work has, has spawned hundreds, if not thousands, of websites around the world talking about conspiracies and Knights Templars and, and the Federal Reserve and the Illuminati and all the secret societies and Knights Templars and and the National Treasure, one and two, and Da Vinci Code, and and all of these, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, cables companies, HBO and Discovery Channel and History Channel, on all the Illuminati and dark secrets of the of the churches. That's the kind of thing I've been pursuing twenty four seven for fifty three years. I'm fascinated and and continually reading and studying the dark secrets of the world that I live in. And for someone to come and take my work and proceed to make a quick buck off of it, to sell it out there and make a quick buck because they don't know what I'm doing. They don't give a damn. They don't care about me or my work. All they want to know is how much can we sell this, this girl for? We kidnapped this girl, this kid. How much can we sell her for? We don't care that we're offending her father and her mother. We don't care that we are, are criminals raping and selling and prostituting. We don't care about that. How much money can we make? And so that's the way I feel. People who have stolen from me and stolen my work and stolen everything and left me with nothing, that's how I feel. Exactly. You, have, you might as well have raped my daughter or killed my son. Because you've taken the only thing that means anything to me is my work, and you have bastardized it and made it into something to make a quick buck for yourself. That's what has happened to me at this very moment. My website's gone. My bank account's gone. My, my products are gone. My work is gone. It's been stolen. And I lay and I sit in one room with nothing. After 53 years of pursuing my work, I now have nothing. It's been stolen from me.
by people who couldn't care less about me or my person. They want to make a quick buck off of me. That's that's the light. That is so. That's exactly what I feel about these people. I feel that they have raped and destroyed my life and my work and who I am, and I cannot do anything about it because I've never pursued money like them. I pursued my work. So I sit in one room with nothing, waiting for my God to give me back my work and my life. And Jordan, this being said, that Jupiter is in the fifth house, very close to Cetus. That Jupiter makes a square to the planet Pluto. And uh, when Pluto talks to anything, Pluto always elevates the level of talent and power. And to someone who does not have the eyes to see, it looks a bit obsessive. Okay? I don't see it that way. I think that's a gift. But you have Pluto making a square to that Jupiter in the fifth. And Jupiter is the dignified co-ruler of Pisces in the fourth. So this is your children. But also, too, the 24-7 pursuit of that. I, in point of fact, think that's true. I think when you're talking about square angles, you get a lot of these cookie-cutter astrology books, and they say, well, Pluto square this or Mercury square that. The person's going to suffer from this, and they're going to have these character flaws. I'm, I don't agree with that assessment. I think when you have a square, that's such a dynamic, energetic aspect that from a mundane point of view, it can appear to be disruptive because the person has to express that energy. They have to do it. it. The switch never goes to the off position or standby. It's 24 seven and it becomes disruptive. In your case, it's a dragon's tail in Pisces. Dignified co-ruler Pisces is Jupiter and uh, Jupiter is making a square to Pluto. People hear you talk, they've looked at what you've done and their assessment is, and you can see where the dragon's tail causes stress. They just think he's crazy. He doesn't know what he's doing. He's crazy. They're not looking at it from a broader cosmic perspective, which I think astrology brings to the table. It brings in a broader perspective. It shows, no, there's larger primordial forces at play here. You're not just going to be dismissive and reduce it down to it's a simple matter of him just being crazy. It's Jupiter square Pluto. And that Pluto is in the eighth house, which is the house of death. Okay? Now, I, I think death can mean many things. Death could be a philosophical epiphany. That's a form of death. You never see the world the same way again. Death could be the end of a relationship. Okay? Death just doesn't have to be mere uh, cessation of physical life. Point being is, though, you have a Jupiter very close to Cetus making a square to Pluto in the eighth house. This is something, once again, that you couldn't stop if you wanted to, in my opinion. This is 24-7. You go to a restaurant with someone, I want to talk about the truth. You want to call me on the phone? Let's talk about the truth. I want to sit behind my computer? I want to talk about the truth. 24-7. I'm not interested in making a dollar. Well, you can see how that could become somewhat disruptive if people don't honor and acknowledge the strength of that one particular aspect. And that's one aspect of many. Oftentimes, when I do a complete reading, it may take two or three parts, six, seven hours total. Because we just getting warmed up, Jordan. <laughs> well, I know. So this is this to me when I see this Jupiter square Pluto. Once again, you could not stop if you wanted to. And you and I know over the past 17.5 years, there's times you have wanted to stop because it's such a demoralizing journey because you have Mercury in Sagittarius. It's very hard to articulate without some type of other concept which astrology brings to the table. Astrology gives you another conceptual, broader perspective which, which, within which to articulate these things. But just telling somebody on the street, you don't understand. You're going to try to make a quick buck off of me and you don't understand. This is my life. This is this. This is that. They're really not going to get it. It's going to be very hard to articulate just how strongly you feel. And, you know, this is where I think the value of a natal chart reading comes in. I mean, it, it gives one a little more clarity that I couldn't stop if I wanted to. I've got Jupiter square Pluto. And when Jupiter squares Pluto, Jupiter... Jupiter always has to do with bigness, expansion, growth, 
and Pluto, anything Pluto touches um, elevates the level of, of power. So when Jupiter's talking to Pluto, you're talking about shoot the biggest of the biggest. It's like you didn't just come here to, uh, you know, fix the bingo game down at the local church. You came to basically come and challenge all the existing institutions at the core level. <laughs> and th this is just the beginning of this chart reading, Jordan. When you get into the dragon's tail, the dragon's tail represents personality constructs, personality traits, personality characteristics, an area where the soul has exercised certain functions of the personality over and over again. That's the personality. That's an ego construct. I'm not in agreement. I put it out there publicly. I'm not in agreement with the doctrine that one should destroy the ego. I don't think so. And that's what the dragon's tail represents. Um, the idea is to get the ego in alignment with the deeper primordial forces at play in your life for what we would call a soul. So I almost think the soul has a dragon's tail, which would be represented by the natal position of Pluto. And then you have to use your imagination to imagine a dragon's head for the soul, which would be Pluto and its polarity point. Um, the point I'm trying to make about this, when you start getting into the past lives in a chart, I'm not so good that I can perform miracles and look at this chart and say, all right, you were born in 1492, you were born in a German principality, father's name was Gunther, mother's name was Gertruda, you ate too much Brockwurst, they beat you like a stepchild, they, saw, they sold you off to Prince Wolfgang, and he beat you more like a stepchild because you actually were. I can't see it that clearly, but I think what one can do with a natal chart, you look at the dragon's tail, uh, you're looking at something that's historical, that's factual. Well, take Oliver Stone's movie, um, Platoon. Charlie Sheen's character in that movie is a fictitious character, but it's set within a historical, factual context. And even though you're seeing fact and fiction uh, mixed together, you still walk away with a sense of truth of what the dynamics of what that war was about. So when I look at the dragon's tail and then I look at Pluto, which in my mind represents a type of dragon's tail for the soul, one can look at these histor this historical context, use one's imagination and common sense to come up with a scenario. What were the past lives? Oftentimes though, that use of imagination and common sense within this historical context of the chart will basically give you the dynamics of what the past lives were. Point I'm trying to make, you've got Pluto and Cancer in the eighth house of corporate endeavors, and you've got a dragon's tail in Pisces, which is suggestive of being cloistered away in a temple somewhere, pursuing truth. But the dragon's tail, you normally give it a negative connotation. So you may have saw some things in regards to corporate finance and uh, the pursuit of spirituality that you thought, boy, oh boy, this is not what I thought it was. We're not really pursuing the ethical ideal here. Can you see how a drag is tail and Pluto in the eighth house of corporate money? How, how, how you would want to basically be looking at banking and how it's tied to religion and tied to that because you've been there. That's what the chart's suggestive of. And you did not like what you see. So, your life also bears testimony to this. You have the utmost respect for the Bible, but you've also seen how it's been manipulated and used to obfuscate spiritual truths. But, That's exactly right. But it's the same thing with, you're, you're, not, you're not purporting to be an atheist. You're not attacking religion that way. You're talking about the corruption and you see how it's filtered through uh, society as a whole. So you could see here, basically, I mean, it just, that's an imaginative historical, uh, that's an imaginative scenario I've created using this chart. But I think it's, it's an accurate reflection of the dynamics of one's life. No doubt about it. I mean, I, I live my work and I was thinking, you know, what, just think about it. If you were living in the Middle Ages, and you were in the church in the, in Rome, and and you had, uh, and uh, and you were in the church, and you would see Michelangelo uh, carving in marble some monstrously beautiful, uh, divinely inspired sculpture. 
and you tell him, look at, uh, you know, just get on with it. What we need want to sell these things. Just, just chip something out real quick. We're going to go out and sell it, make a quick buck and go out to dinner tonight. Just throw something together. Don't sit there all day long working on that little quarter inch around the eye. I mean, my God, that's ridiculous. Just chisel something out real quick and let's go out there and make a quick buck. And, uh, and uh, this way I can get myself a new clothes and I can buy my girlfriend some flowers and buy myself a couple of beers and some wine. And what the hell are you doing? Just sitting here all day long, you know, working on one eye for three days to make it flawlessly perfect. I mean, we don't need that. We need to make some money here. So get off your lazy ass and go out there and make some money. What kind of a what kind of a, re, a, 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 a reaction would you expect Michelangelo to have to that kind of stupidity and human uh, and ignorance and stupidity? Well, that's the way I feel about my work. I'm not here to make you a quick buck. I'm here to do what my God has given me to do, and that is to uncover the darkness, the lies, the deception the absolute conspiracy against God and man to manipulate the human race and, and rape the human race and make money off of the human race. Well, I'm here to uncover and expose that dark conspiracy. And because of that, I don't care about the money. I care about my work. And unfortunately, other people coming and seeing that think, well, here's an old man that we can rip off and sell him and sell his stuff, take everything he's got, rip him off and sell it all and make us have some money. My God will not allow that. So these people who have stolen from me, what goes around will come around. It always does. It always has. So I've tried to tell people when, you know, when you steal from the spirit, when you're offending the spirit, be very careful because it's going to come back on you. So I just do what I do. And, and, and at 73 years old, I'm not, I'm not concerned about my life. I won't be here much longer. I'm only concerned about what's been given to me to do. I want my life back. I want my work back. I want everything that was taken from me. I want it back so that I can continue my work and finish what I have to do. I don't care about the money. I care about the truth. That's who I am. And that's what I do. And Jordan, it's this all being said, I mean, once again, you know, I, uh, yeah, there, there's something I call a complete reading, but strictly speaking, there's no such thing as a complete reading because you cannot solve the enigma of someone's existence. I don't, once again, I don't have the IQ of a Stephen Hawking a uh, Albert Einstein, Nikolai Tesla combined with the uh, IQ of an advanced alien species and God. I think that's really what would be required to do what's called a complete reading in the strictest sense of the word. But this all being said, um, even this reading here, which has been about an hour, and that's only 1% of what could be said about your chart. We've not even gotten into the aspects yet or even explored Venus and Afiuk and Scorpio, Mars and Libra, profound sense of justice, which is opposing a Uranus, which just left Aries and went into Taurus in your sixth house. I mean, there's so much to be said in a complete reading, okay? What I call a complete reading, even though strictly speaking, it's not a complete reading. You can't solve the enigma of someone's existence. But... This all being said, when one gets a natal chart read like this, and sometimes I, you know, I could go on with you for uh, easily another four hours, another four hours. But I always ask people, and I'm asking you, is it helpful to look at your life within this particular conceptual framework, which is astrology? Myself, I would think it would be because it just it reflects the dynamics, hopefully and just shows you that there's deep primordial forces at play here. I have to honor who I am. I can't escape that. I think that's valuable. I think that's useful. Well, let me tell you what I think. I think that when good people, bad things happen to good people, and Christians around the world and Jews and, and all good people, when things happen to them, they, they, they tend to 
uh, turned and asked, well, why did God allow this to happen? Why did God allow that to happen? Take my son. Now, why did this not happen? Why would God allow this or that? But when you understand what God, which is G-O-D, which is dog spelled backwards, when you understand theology and where it came from and its man-made concepts, man-made ideas and concepts that go back to the ancient world, once you understand the real story of how we got here, who we are, who created us, and what's really going on, not what you thought was happening, then for the first time you see that we are being guided by a higher force. Ask any child, where is God? They'll point straight up into the heavens. Well, that's true. God is out there. And so what's out there? Well, it's the stars, it's the, it's the heavens. And so we are a product of the heavens. And so that's why this particular kind of astral theology that you're dealing with is so important because when bad things happen to me, I don't get, uh, I, I don't blow out all out of shape and become emotional and, and, and erect because I realize it's all part of a whole uh, reading of my life in the stars. So I understand I'm going through certain periods of time, certain things are happening, and there's nothing you're going to do about it. The, the, the stars are where they are. And my mother used to say, you can thank your lucky stars. Well, when you get into religion and theology, which I can pontificate about for the next uh, five hours on where the conceptual ideas for religion and church has come from, it's actually based on astrology. Judaism, Christianity, Islam, all of it is astrology. But it's a very high form of astrology. It's not the Mickey Mouse stuff that you get in the newspapers. I'm talking about a very ancient arcane understanding of the ancient peoples, the ancient Egyptians, the ancient Babylonians, the Chaldeans, the ancient Hindus. They knew something that today we don't know. And we like to ridicule people of the ancient world because we're so damn smart. Well, look what we have done to the earth as humans today. We're not that smart. And so I appreciate the fact that astrology in its purest and correct form understanding is the essence of who we are. And until and unless we understand that, we're going to continue to make all kinds of mistakes. And so that's why I really appreciate understanding what's going on with me when I talk with you and get a reading, because I know whatever's happening to me is not God doing it. It's the stars. It's, uh, it's just part of my destiny. It's who I am. I have to suffer like everyone else does. I have to suffer through my mistakes and through my life. But at least I know why. Because the stars, you know, to talk with you, I understand now why things are happening to me. Therefore, it's not personal. I understand. I have a work to do. And sometimes the stars are in your favor. Sometimes the heavens are in your favor. Sometimes it's not. Uh, and that, that, makes me, that makes it much more easier for me to accept. So that's why I think it's so important for people to get a reading to find out what is you know what is their destiny according to the very stars that are over your head and we've said i've said this to you before <clears throat> that mankind has navigated for thousands and thousands of years men have navigated around the high seas of the world on the high seas out in the middle of the ocean there's no way to tell where you are unless you understand how to read the stars so mankind has navigated around the planet for thousands of years by a knowledge of the stars. So I'm saying, why don't you navigate your personal life by the stars? And so that's why I see the value in what you're doing and, and being able to understand your life in relation to the stars. And I told you in the Middle Ages, the word star, we spell it S-T-A-R, but in the Middle Ages, it was spelled A-S-T-A-R, Astar. 
And the idea expressed in the Middle Ages is that if you don't understand in your personal life the astars, A-S-T-A-R-S, if you don't understand the astars in your life, then your life is going to be a disastar. And that's where we get the word disaster. So, so many people have made a disaster of their life because they don't realize how God impacts the human life on the earth through the stars. It's a magnificent story, and that's why it's so important to me to have you come out and talk to the public about how to read the heavens in your personal life. That's why everyone should get a reading as far as I'm concerned, because it's the first time you will really begin to see what's going on in your life. And if there's anybody who can do it, I've watched a lot of people try. Joe is the best of the best, in my opinion. Everyone should get a reading from Joe. I would highly recommend it. And then while we're talking about that, Joe, why don't you slowly and concisely explain to people how they can get a reading from you, like you've been doing with me. And like you said, you can go on for another four hours. And I know that your readings are very long, and you record the readings, and you send people uh, an audio file, an audio recording of the reading. And so it's a very long reading. That's why you have to send the audio recording, because there's a lot of things in there that they don't get the first time. So you not only get a reading, but you get an audio file so you can listen to the reading over and over and over again. So tell them how that they can get a reading from you. What do they have to do? Where do they go? You go to truezodiac.org, truezodiac.org. Once again, truezodiac.org and click the button in the upper right that says click here for your reading. And everything after that is self-explanatory. And uh, this all being said, Jordan, I like to comment on the nature of a reading. I'm of the opinion the sky belongs to everybody. If everyone knew the symbols, um, they, could, they could do a reading for themselves that would be far more accurate than mine. Okay, um, But it's just a matter of learning the language, and not everyone has the time to do that. But once again, that needs to be said. And... Uh, also, too, with these chart readings, um, you know, I, I always maintain it's a healthy and mature attitude to be extremely dubious and skeptical about astrology. Be slow to believe. On the other hand, myself, thinking practically, I've also said, but it's also good to not prejudice any source of information. All right? So that's, that's kind of covering all the bases, Jordan. You and I seem to be in agreement there's something going on here that works, okay? But I'll, I'll, I'll concede to some of the critics' opinions. But one thing I will say, when you look at what the physicists say, the astrophysicists, they will tell you every atom that, we, that we're composed of came out of the guts of exploding, dying stars. So there is, there seems to be in humanity this innate longing to return to the stars. As you said, Jordan, ask a child, where's God? Where do they point? They point to where the stars are. Let's take Genesis 1.14. And God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night. And let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years once again and god said let there be lights stars in the firmament of the heaven because they're fixed relative to the earth to divide the day from the night and let them be for signs and that word signs in the hebrew genesis 1 14 where god said let the lights in the heavens be for signs the word science in Hebrew is oth, O-T-H, which is translated in the Hebrew to mean zodiac or horoscope. Go get a, a dictionary and look up the word in Genesis 1.14, where God said, let the lights in the heavens be for science. That's what we call astrological signs. That's what the word signs in Hebrew means. 
It's spelled O T H, Oth, meaning horoscope. That's the way the King James Bible dictionary, that's the way the Bible dictionaries puts it. Oth means uh, zodiac or horoscope. I didn't write the Bible, I'm just telling you what the word means in Hebrew. Go read it. So when God says, let them be for signs, he's talking about astrological signs, off, horoscope, get it? And let's add a further quote, and this is uh, pertaining to a so-called pagan, Aristotle. The origin of all human knowledge about the substance of divine matters is twofold the outward phenomena of the sky and the inward phenomena of the soul, or uh, hermetically expressed as above, so below. And think about that from a practical point of view. Just be extremely practical. What on this earth has not been tainted by humanity? You're right. So when you're looking at the stars, I'm not aware of anyone with enough, uh, enough power to rearrange the constellations no matter how how much wealth they have, how corrupt they are, the stars remain relatively fixed. Yeah. Your Big Dipper is going to stay the Big Dipper. So just from a, looking at things from a very practical vantage point, that seems to be the only thing, the closest to undiluted truth a human being on the surface of the earth is going to get. How do you know a word or two wasn't changed in any book you read to subtly change the meaning? You don't. That's right. And then you take kings and queens, potentates, emperors. Okay, well, often they're being assassinated by their courtiers. That's where the very heart of the plot is. So how can a king or queen trust his messenger? What does he have... What, what can he verify the truth of the message against? Can't, rep, can't verify it against the book or what someone else says to him. The only thing that's going to basically remain, for all intents and purposes, undiluted truth is going to be the stars. I'm inclined to think, just thinking practically, using common sense, maybe that's why these medieval kings and emperors in Asia and uh, Europe, medieval Europe, they all had their court astrologers like John D and Queen Elizabeth. Yeah, of course, all the all the kings and rulers and princes of the world have had court astrologers. Why? Because they're not stupid. I mean, we're the ones that are stupid. We have our silly religions, and there's two hundred, two thousand four hundred and sixty. The last time I saw the the numbers, two thousand four hundred and sixty different. Christian religions on the earth. 2,400 Christian religions. All of them different. Everybody's saying something different. But the people who run this planet, they are on a need to know basis. They don't care about what you believe. They want to know. So the people who run the planet, the great masters of commerce and industry and banking, the people who run the planet, they know astrology. They know astrology. They are paying people to look into the heavens and see when the right thing to do, when is the right time for this, good or bad. One other thing I would add about astrology people need to think about. When Jesus said, when you pray, pray this way, and we call it, Christians call, the, call that the Lord's Prayer. Well, in point of fact, it's not the Lord's Prayer. Uh, the Lord told you when you pray, you pray this way, not me. I'm the Lord. I have a different prayer. But when you pray, the Lord's Prayer well, was when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, when he was talking to his father, when Jesus is, is talking to God. That's the Lord's Prayer. But the Lord said, when you pray, you pray this way. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And he said, let thy kingdom come and thy will be done 
on the earth as it is in heaven. Well, first of all, what kind of life form on the earth do we put into a kingdom? We know that fish are in schools, dogs travel in packs, cattle are in herds, lions are in prides, birds are in flocks, but what is it that's in a kingdom if it's not animals? We call it the animal kingdom. Where do you find animals? In a zoo, which gives us our word zodiac. Zodiac comes from zoo, zodiac, meaning a kingdom. Well, of course, the animal kingdom, the zodiac. And so when Jesus said, let thy kingdom come, let thy will be done on the earth as it is in heaven, the Knights Templar said the same thing. The Masonic Order of Knights Templars in the Middle Ages said, as above, so below. So let that kingdom come, meaning that the kingdom of animals, the animal kingdom, come and let the, your will, God, let your will be done on the earth as it is in the heaven. Well, of course, if you look into the heavens, you will see the animals of the zoo, zodiac. And that is God's kingdom. And you're simply saying to God, the great spirit, let your kingdom of animals, the zoo, zodiac, let your kingdom come and let your will be done on the earth as it is in heaven. Well, of course, my, my thought is you don't have to ask God to let his kingdom come and his will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. There's no need to ask God for that because his kingdom is going to come, whether you like it or not. You have no say-so in it. The heavens don't decide uh, to do what you want. So when it's time for Aries to move into a position in the heavens to rule for thousands of years, for 2,150 years, the Egyptians understood that. That's why they had the, uh, the Aries, the ram god of Egypt. And then when the Jews were worshiping their god, Yahweh, in the heavens, in the, in the age of Taurus the bull, or the golden calf, golden for the sun in the age of Taurus the bull, the golden calf. And then when the next age coming was Aries, the ram, so that the Jews now blow the shofar or the ram's horn. And Jordan, let me, let me comment. When, uh... You're talking about the age of Taurus and Moses. God said, what a stiff-necked people. That's right. That's well, exactly right. Well, isn't, doesn't, that, doesn't that pertain to the neck of a bull? I think that qualifies as stiff-necked. They, they worshiped a golden calf, and they're obstinate. And what a stiff-necked people. That's that. And that golden calf, at the same time, was also understood in India. The Hindus understood the golden calf. That's why they, we today say holy cow, because the cow was holy, because the cow is the, from the bull. The bull is Taurus, holy cow. That's why bulls are still worshipped today in India. That's why the, that's why the, and then when you get into the ram's horn, the shofar, it has to do with astrology. The rabbis have told me this for years. Of course, all of Judaism is astrology. This is why today Christians uh, are worshiping the, uh, the, the, in Christianity. And what is, the two, what is the symbol for Jesus if it isn't the two fish? Jesus fed his multitude with two fish. Let me comment on that, Jordan. But he also had five loaves of bread. Well, bread pertains to wheat. What is opposite Pisces, the constellation of Virgo? 
So now you know why there's bread, that represents Virgo, and why there's fish, that represents Pisces. That's right. And Virgo is a woman. That's why Jesus is born of a virgin. A virgin, woman. That's why one of the 12 apostles was a woman. And that's why we say Jesus is born of a virgin, Virgo, one of the 12 signs of the zodiac, the zoo in the, in the heavens, the zodiac, the kingdom. So let your kingdom come. It's going to. And let your will be done. It's going to, whether you like it or not, as it is in heaven. That's right. As above, so below. So the church has made sure that people do not know that God's will is expressed on the earth by the star. And unless and until you understand that, you're never going to figure out why there are 12 apostles, there are 12 signs of the zodiac, there are 12 months of the year, the 12 brothers of Joseph, the 12 tribes of Israel, the 12 great prophets of Israel, Everything is in 12. Look in the back of a Bible and the and see how many 12s are in the Bible. 12 is important because it matches the 12 signs of the zodiac. And Jesus is referred to as God's son, the light of the world. Of course, the sun is the light of the world. And of course, it has 12 followers, the 12 apostles, or the 12 brothers of Joseph, or the 12 tribes of Israel, the 12 of the 12 signs of the zodiac, because Jesus said, I am the truth and the light. That's why if you go into a courtroom, you're going to have a jury made up of 12 people. Why? Because those 12 helpers are going to establish the truth and the light. As Jesus said, I am the truth and the light. So they're going to the 12 jurors or the 12 apostles, the 12 signs of the zodiac. Get it? It's a 12 step court system. That's right. And it's that's you have to, and you go to school, your primary and elementary school is grades one through 12. That's it. The 12 that's step the program. program. So I'm saying that God's kingdom is the zodiac. So let your kingdom come and let your will be done on the earth. Well, it's going to. And let your will be done on the earth as it is in heaven. Yeah, that's right. Look up there and you will see Taurus. And you'll see uh, Pisces. And of course, Jesus, uh, Jesus is represented by two fish, two fish of Pisces. And when he goes out, when the sun, God's sun, the light of the world, when the sun moves out of Pisces, where is it going to move into next? In the next 2,150 years, the next sign that the sun will move into is Aquarius. Get it? This is the dawning, the sunrise. This is the dawning of the age of Aquarius. What is a symbol of Aquarius? Well, in the book, in the Bible, in the uh, New Testament, Jesus, in the book of Luke, Luke 22.10, go to the Bible and read it. And Jesus tells his 12, this is God's son, the light of the world, talking to his chosen 12 astrology, uh, symbols, the 12 months of the year, the 12 signs of the zodiac. So God's son is saying to the 12, they say to him, well, when you're leaving, where are we going to go when you leave? He says in, in Luke 22, 10, go into the city and you will see a man carrying a pitcher of water. Go into the house of the man with the water pitcher. Anyone who's got more than 500 brain cells who has studied theology and knows anything about the culture of the Middle East and ancient history knows, I don't have to tell them, people who have studied theology know that nowhere in the Middle East in ancient history or modern history, nowhere does man carry water. 
Carrying water from the well was a woman's job. It's like a man today wearing a dress in public. Men did not carry water. That's a woman's job ever. And so today when you hear that Jesus talked with the women at the well, it's always the women at the well. He approached the woman at the well. Even today in Africa, in Asia, in the Middle East, Women go to the well for water, not men. Well, then why would Jesus tell his chosen 12 that I'm going to leave this world? My symbol is the two fish, Pisces. Well, I'm going to leave this world now. I'm going to die. And so they said, the 12 said, well, where are you going to go next? And he said, go into the city and you will see a man with a water pitcher. Go into the house of the man with the water pitcher. That's Aquarius. The, Get it? The water bearer, Aquarius. The water bearer. Oth, O T H, Genesis 114, horoscope, astrology. And the rabbis and the priests and the and the people that I've talked to, all of the religionists I've talked to over the last 53 years, I used to sit with the rabbis at the Simon Wiesenthal Center for Holocaust Studies in Los Angeles on Pico. I used to sit there for hours upon hours, and I'd go up to the uh, the Skirball Center and, and, and up in the mountains of uh, Los Angeles to the big Jewish uh, synagogues and Jewish uh, uh, universities and sit with the rabbis. I used to sit and talk with rabbis years ago, with the Jesuit priests, with the theologians. I've spent my life pursuing wisdom. And all of the rabbinical authorities I talked to, the rabbis, the priests, the clergy, they all say, yeah, it's, you're true. it's right. Judaism is based on astrology. Yes, that's true. And Christianity, yes, that's true. That's why Jesus had 12 apostles. He was the son. God's son, the light of the world. Yeah, I know, the whole thing is astrology, period. So when are the people going to wake up and get back in tune with the divine? Because in the Old Testament, there's a scripture where God says to the, to the people of, of his time, of that time, God says, go back to the old way. You have taken a wrong road. You're confused. Your, your world is filled with violence and drugs and pornography and wars and violence and stupidity and degradation. Go back to the old way. Why? Because as above, so below. You're in confusion because you don't understand. You need to stand under the subject to understand it. So all I'm saying is that People, if they want to find out what's going on in their life, they need to understand their connection, their life, and its connection to the star. Go back to the old way, the auth in Genesis 114, zodiac horoscope. But not just to astrology, no. Astrology today is, for the most part, of guessing game. But what Nostradamus was able to do was nail it down for sure. And that's why 500 years later, after his, after his death, he is still referenced today. He's still looked upon as a great prophet, Nostradamus. Why? Because he was so damn accurate about people's lives. That's what we're doing here. What Joe is doing is called the Nostradamus Method. Let me comment on that, Jordan. And anyone can go to YouTube and look up a video, The Lost Book of Nostradamus. And there's reference to a constellation called Ophiuchus. Ophiuchus does not exist when you're using astrological signs. Common sense leads one to the conclusion that, therefore, he, Nostradamus must have been pointing his telescope at the sky because he's talking about Ophiuchus. Yeah, he's not reading it from a book. He's actually looking at the sky. And I don't think he's using signs. Because Aphiuchus doesn't exist when you're using signs. 
Well, I know. And part of what you do, I'll tell the audience, part of what Joe does when he does a reading for you, and at whatever sign you think you are, you're not. So you better go back and do your homework and, and talk to Joe about this. But whatever sign that you think you are, you're, you're not. And that's why if you get readings based on the sign that you think you are, it's not going to be correct. Why? Because you're the wrong sign. Yeah, because uh, no one's taking into account the procession of the equinoxes. Now, people who like the signs, they they go into justifying why that's so. But I think the simpler path, just use the background of the actual stars. When you're using signs, you're talking about a man-made projection onto the ecliptic. It should be called, strictly speaking, in my opinion, eclipticology, not astrology. There's no stars in it whatsoever other than the sun. So that's that's another whole long debate. And uh, Well, let me throw this in. I know I've watched you do it. When you are calculating someone's chart, when someone orders a reading from you, it's not some uh, a light, light, thing to do just to read through a chart quickly and give them no no what you do takes hours and hours of calculation on an individual basis and one of the things i've seen you do many times is when a person tells you their birthday you will go to the united states naval observatory on the web and also the british uh, observatory the royal observatory in england and put in their birth date into that, uh, that website and see what the United States Naval Observatory says about that particular date and what was the, uh, the, the, what was the sign in heaven on that particular date. Yeah, NASA, the NASA, the ephemeris for NASA, when they talk about uh, you know Pisces, they're talking about the constellation. They're not talking about a sign. They're telling you that astronomical location of these uh, planetary bodies and the sun and the moon and the north and south node that's correct that's what i used to do i used to do that then i found a program that gives me a sky map gives you an astronomical sky map and you use that it just yeah. makes sense to me yeah so the what i'm saying is that if you're born like i was on december 28th the books will tell you, of course, those books are very old and they're based on hundreds of years old. So the books will tell you that I am a Capricorn, December 28th. But if you go to the Royal Observatory in England or the uh, Naval, uh, U.S. Naval Observatory, they will tell you no, no, and no. No, the sign that was actually in the heaven in 1940 is... Uh, Sagittarius. The constellation, in yeah. Fact, in point of fact, not according to your book. Your book, yes, you are a Capricorn. But in point of fact, if you go out and look at the heavens, the stars directly over your head is Sagittarius. Why? Because you would have been a Capricorn if you had lived 2,150 years ago. But the sun has moved in the past 2,150 years, so you're actually in a new sign. You're in the sign of Sagittarius if you're in December 28th. That's why people get so confused and there's so much confusion in reading people's charts because you're starting off at the wrong sign to begin with. Correct, yeah, and it's actually the constellation. Your sun's in the constellation of Sagittarius. I mean... Your son, even now, is in the sign Capricorn. But there's a whole big debate around this, and more about this is eventually going to come out by people much more well-researched who have the resources and the time to really explain this. There was a time not so long ago when what we call the tropical zodiac aligned itself with the constellations. And due to the procession of the equinoxes, those two are now out of alignment. So that's what's going on, Jordan. Even today, the way they calculate the tropical zodiac, you would remain, in terms of sign, a Capricorn. But the astronomical fact is, on the day you were born, what was behind the sun, what one would see, is the constellation of Sagittarius. 
And I think that's more authoritative than a man-made projection onto the ecliptic called signs. But this will, other authors and other researchers eventually will bring out the story behind that. That's a long story. And uh, when you look at these megalithic structures around the earth, just go on to uh, YouTube. Try to find the shows about ancient Egypt and how those, uh, temple, those temples they found out were aligned to the constellations. They're not now due to the procession of the equinoxes. But when you, when you account for the passage of time, you can see these megalithic structures were aligned to the stars, to the constellations. I'm of the opinion, okay, I'm, take, I'm making an educated guess because I don't have the resources to be an archaeologist and explore all these things and do all the work, but uh, one can't go wrong using the background of the stars, uh, in my opinion, um, because man did not put that there. Something much greater than man, a higher power, literally and figuratively speaking, put those constellations there and put those stars there and the astrophysicists will tell you every atom that makes up what we call the earth and our bodies they will say we are congealed and condensed stardust and where do you go when you die heaven well as you said jordan ask a child where's heaven they will point to the stars there seems to be something innately in our souls that longs to return there and Albert Einstein said it too, I'm paraphrasing, but I think he said the stars are the elixir of life. That's right. So, I guess there's only one thing else I would say. It'll take me a couple of minutes to explain this. But when you hear Christians say, well, the Bible condemns astrology, condemns those who study the stars, and tells you not to have anything to do with those who study the stars. Well, that's true. Now, let me tell you why. It's because Moses, when we talk about Moses was the writer of the first five books of the Bible. Well, that is strictly not true. Moses did not write the first five books of the Bible. Why? Because there was no Moses. Moses never existed. The rabbis know that. The rabbis uh, will, uh, will tell you in point of fact, King David, King Solomon, uh, Moses, uh, uh, King Solomon, all the uh, uh, famous names of the ancient uh, Bible and the Old Testament of the Bible, the Torah, those people never lived. There were no such people. There was no Samson. There was no Moses. There was no King Solomon or King David, even the Jewish encyclopedia, Judica talking about King David, says there is really no evidence that a King David ever existed, period. End of sentence. Jewish encyclopedia. There is no express uh, proof that a King David ever lived. There is no proof anywhere that a King Solomon ever lived. So that's what the Jewish encyclopedia and the Jewish writers and the Hebrew writers in Israel are saying, that Moses did not open up the Red Sea and millions of Jews go through the Red Sea. Didn't happen, hasn't happened, couldn't happen, impossible, and therefore it is a story. That's why the Bible is called the greatest story ever told. It's just a story. But when you hear people talking about how the Bible says they have nothing to do with those people who study the stars, it's because what we call Moses was actually a religious uh, philosophy in the time that Moses would have been alive, in the time in which Moses, if he had lived, would have lived. At that time in history, the world was under the influence of moon worshiping. That's why today, in the Middle East, the moon is the most important god. Islam is based on the worship of the moon god. Go back to the Encyclopedia Britannica, Americana, 
uh, Jewish encyclopedia, Catholic encyclopedia, I don't care where you go. Go to any language, go back to any encyclopedia, any Bible reference work, any Bible encyclopedia, any Bible dictionary. Do some homework. Actually, go to the library and sit and read, and you will see that a thousand years before, uh, before Muhammad ever lived, in Arabic, in the Arabic world, Mecca was a very important spot, and the building that we call the Kaaba was already there, being worshipped by the Arabic peoples. They would come there in their pilgrimage to Mecca to see the Kaaba uh, a thousand years before um, before uh, Muhammad ever lived. Why? Because Mecca was the center for moon worship. The moon god in the ancient Arabic world, his name was Sin, S-I-N, Sin. Look it up in a dictionary, a, a Bible dictionary. Look up the word Sin, S-I-N, and it will tell you Sin was the name of a moon god in the ancient prehistoric ancient world of uh, Arabia, and the word for a, a mountain in the ancient and prehistoric language was Ai. Ai, mountain, and Sin was the god of the mountain, the moon, who lived in the mountain. You put it together and become Sinai. No, not Sinai, Sin Ai, the moon god who lived in the mountain. And so Moses, theologically represents moon worship. That's why you will hear people of the Islamic faith telling you that Allah is actually mentioned in the Christian Torah, and the, I mean, the, the Jewish Torah, in the Old Testament, there, is, there are scriptures that actually mention Allah. And so that shows that the Islamic religion is the, is the true religion because it's even in the Bible. And I said, you know, you have to be really stupid to buy into that. Of course, Allah would be in the Old Testament. Of course, Allah would be mentioned in the Old Testament. Allah was the name of the moon god in the Arabic tongue. But in the old Phoenician Canaanite tongue and the ancient Egyptian tongue, the moon was called different things. Well, in the time of, of, uh, of Moses, when there was no Moses, but in that time period in Egypt, the moon god was known as Sin. Sin in the moon came up from the mountain. This is why today, even today, the Jews worship they have their holy days after sundown. Why is that? Why do Jews have their holy days celebrated after sundown, after six o'clock? I'm not making this up. It's Judaism. The reason why Jews have their holy days after sundown is because that's when the damn moon comes up. That's when the moon comes up from behind the AI, the mountain, or Mount Sinai. There was no Moses. It's a story. It's an encoded astrological, astrotheological story that the people who study theology and religion, like me for some 53 years, knows this. But the people of the world don't know this. Why? Because it has nothing to do with basketball and television and the Dodgers. So they don't know. So once you understand that Moses was the leader of a lunar cult, even today the Jews will tell you their calendar is a lunar calendar, while Christians have a solar calendar. Christians follow the sun on Sunday. We go to church on sun, S-U-N, Sunday. And so therefore God's son Jesus has 12 helpers. He's in heaven, the light of the world. Christianity is the worship of the sun with his 12 helpers, while Judaism is connected directly to the worship of the moon, sin, AI. 
So there was the Moses, we're talking about moon worship. And where were they? They were in the Middle East. Well, that's where the Arabs are in the Middle East. And the Arabs still today are worshiping the same old pagan moon god they have always worshiped. A thousand years before Mohammed ever lived, the Arabs were marching around the Kaaba. And it's always represented the moon. This is why on all the mosques in the Middle East, you will see the crescent moon. Get it? So once you understand that the moon worshipers did not like the sun worshipers. So that's why Moses would have said, have all have nothing to do, and the Old Testament have nothing to do with astrology, or the moon, or the stars, people who look to God in the stars. Why? Because the very oldest conceptual idea of theology and religion on the face of the earth, as far back as we can go, seven to 10,000 years ago, the very earliest recollection of theology were the ancient peoples who studied the stars, who understood the constellation of the stars, and that's why every culture on the earth, from the Native Americans, Eskimos, to South America, to China, to India, to Russia, to um, um, all over the earth, all ancient cultures had a zodiac. Everybody. Everybody had the zodiac. Why? It's because it's the oldest conceptual idea of the divine on the earth ever is the zodiac. Well, the moon worshippers didn't like the people who found God in the stars and studied the stars. They want to study the moon, Allah, and all that silly nonsense of Allah, the moon God. Well, Moses was the leader of a moon cult, and that's why the Jews have their holy days after sundown, because that's when the moon comes out. They have a lunar calendar. Get it? So I'm saying that you need to understand that theology, the ancient theology, that's why the Bible says go back to the old way. The old way is the heavens, the stars. So if you want to criticize, then you better understand what Jesus said when you pray, ask for God's kingdom, the animal kingdom. Where do you find animals? In a zoo that's called Zodiac. Zodiac. So I'm just telling you that there are 12 signs of the zoo or Zodiac, 12 helpers of Jesus, the 12 followers of Jesus, 12 brothers of Joseph, 12 tribes of Israel, 12 great prophets of, of Israel, you need to understand for the first time the Bible is astrology. And there was a war going on between the moon worshipers and the sun worshipers and the original star people, the people who studied the stars. Astrology is the old way. So you need to go back and do some homework and get a reading from Joe. Tell them how they can get a reading, Joe. Just go to truezodiac.org. True Zodiac is one word. Truezodiac.org. 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 Click the big orange button in the right that says click here for your reading. It's that simple. Okay, Joe. I guess that's it for the evening. All right, Jordan, thank you so much. And I hope the uh, little bit of your complete reading, I put that in quotes that we did, was helpful to you. Yep, it was very helpful. It's right on target. And that's what I want people to hear, is how accurate uh, to understand your life. Because if you understand what the stars, how they operate in your particular life, that's going to answer a lot of questions. So astrology, as it's, as it's practiced today, I'm not impressed with. But what Nostradamus did, I'm very impressed with. And Joe is the only person I know that's really mastered this correctly. Other people know it too. There are other people who read the Nostradamus method. I've met so many of them. They're good people. They are very intelligent. But Joe, in my humble opinion, because I've been all around the world and heard all kinds of people, and my humble opinion, Joe is the best of the best, period. 
That's all I have to say about that. Get a reading from Joe, truezodiac.org. Okay, Jordan, good night. Good night.